finish up at the end. So first of all, thanks again, everybody, for joining. I have a blast uh, leading these classes, and it's really awesome that people are enjoying them. Um, one of the things that I love about jujitsu is if you train, you are a part of this story. You are a part of an exciting story about a martial art that has changed the world, and not just the world of martial arts, but the world generally, because societies evolve martial arts based on their needs. And this is the story of a martial art that we call jujitsu that we are continuing to co-create and evolve together. So no matter what belt level you are, no matter how long you've been training, you were a part of that story. And I think that's pretty exciting. The other thing that excites me a lot, and you heard me and Richard talking earlier about like sharing a passion for history, is that we're learning more about this stuff all the time. We're learning more about Jiro Kano's own educational background. We're learning about the, the red belts in Brazil and where they came from and the work of guys like uh, not just Richard and his team, but like uh, Jose Tufi Kairos, who has a dissertation on jiu-jitsu, Robert Drysdale, who's working on a film called Closed Guard that's going to be out later this summer, Roberto Pedrera, who has a series of books. We're learning and revealing new stuff about this story that fleshes it out all the time. And so that's extremely exciting for me to have our understanding continually updated. And so I do hope you will, if you enjoyed these, check out the work of those folks and to check out Closed Guard, the movie, when it comes out uh, later this summer. So, um, and by the way, that part two, The Metal Years, is a reference to my favorite documentary, which is The Decline of Western Civilization, part two, The Metal Years, about 1980s metal, just so you know. So, in joke, how jiu-jitsu changed the world, part two, The Metal Years. But in terms of introduction, our story today, we're going to start in the 12th century, when there's a host of regional martial arts called Ryu that are developing all over Japan. They're generally going to be practiced by the samurai, who are also called bushi, the upper class, warrior caste. The thing to understand here is you can't separate the way a martial art evolves from the way a society develops. And so some martial arts serve the needs of the society. And so those needs also change as societies change. And so this is the story about how hundreds of regional martial arts styles in Japan came to fall under the umbrella of jujutsu, how jujutsu evolved into judo, uh, with the help of a towering figure named Jigoro Kano, who we'll talk about a lot today, and then how judo started to spread around the world. We're going to stay in Japan for this class, and we're going to go from about the 12th century up uh, through the end of the Second World War, and we'll pick up another part of the, stu the story next Tuesday. So here are our high points for today. We're talking about jujitsu prehistory. Like, what do we know about the earliest origins of jujitsu? We'll talk about the samurai and the gentle art, which as we mentioned in class one is really more like the pliable, flexible, or adaptable art. What was it? How did it resemble what we do today? We'll talk about Japanese political history and how that informs the development of the martial arts from Sekigahara when Japan becomes a unified society for the first time to Sakhalin when the Russo-Japanese war excites the world about Japanese jujitsu. And then we'll talk about Jigoro Kano, who as I mentioned to a bunch of you is one of my favorite figures, not just in martial arts history, but in history generally. We'll talk about how he started training, about why he creates his own school, and about how that helps create what we do. Then he becomes an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Okay, he doesn't. He starts the Kodokan, which is still around today. And if you're in Japan, you can train at the Kodokan for like $10, which is unbelievable. So go to Japan, train at the Kodokan, be a part of history. We'll also talk about Kano's efforts to change Japanese education. He's an educator by trade and not just a professor of jujitsu, but an actual professor of economics and political science and becomes a really important figure in Japanese educational development in the 20th century. So he swims against the tide of Japanese society when nationalism is on the rise and he dies in 1938, but his story doesn't end, it continues forward. And as I say in the last thing, wars don't end stories, but they do interrupt them. So we will interrupt our story at the end of the Second World War today. So that's where we're going to start. So let's kick this pig, as my wife says. She's from the South. They have colorful expressions. So here's the thing. There's an old Japanese proverb that everybody has three hearts. One they keep to themselves, one they show to the world, and one even they don't know about. And I really think that's true. We're all sort of complex little humans. And so what I, what, I, what I want to say here is that the stories we tell ourselves about each other are not always accurate, but the fact that we tell those stories, that this is how we explain ourselves to others, says a lot about us. So according to legend, in 250 AD, the Indian leader Ashoka, that's him with the sweet mustache, develops jujitsu as an art for Buddhist monks. And as Buddhism spreads, so does the art of jujitsu. And these monks, these essential warrior priests, start teaching folks their art. And here's the thing. This isn't, in fact, accurate or at least as best we can be able to tell. At least we can't disprove it because you can't prove a negative, but probably not right. Where does this story come from? 
there's an oral tradition that exists in spaces all over where I've heard this story. And in fact, you can read this story um, in an article on Global Training Report uh, by Dr. Hel Helcio Leobinda, who is the vice president of the Federation of Jiu-Jitsu in Brazil, and Hasten Gracie, who's a red belt. Uh, Professor Moro, a lot of you guys train at Bellingham BJJ, our school. Professor Moro, if you ask him, when he started training in Brazil, his instructor, Carlos Gracie Jr., this was the story that they told them. that This was an art developed by Buddhist monks. And that's how it spread to Brazil. Now, that's oral tradition, right? And what that tells you, I think more than that happened, it's that that's the way these folks were explaining what they did to other folks, that we are essentially these sort of warrior priests. And I think that's really fascinating. But here's the thing, basically all cultures have some, some sort of indigenous grappling art. And we can think of a lot of them from Alam wrestling in Africa to Irish collar and elbow wrestling. All cultures have an indigenous grappling art, either homegrown or one that they incorporated from someplace else. And what's kind of cool about that is that it gives us a commonality around the world, but how this alleged thing that Ashoka did developed into something or looks like, or did not look like what we do today is really anybody's guess. And especially because early reliable information is fairly hard to come by. Let's talk about this. So jujitsu's roots really start as best as we're able to tell in feudal Japan. And they start with the samurai. So the samurai were military nobility uh, in medieval and pre-modern Japan. They were also called bushi. And they practiced a variety of martial arts, both armed and unarmed, kendo, sword play, archery, etc. Eventually, all of those arts get referred to under the umbrella of jujitsu. But at first, um, because Japan is a regional society, at first there's no one unified art. And it's important to understand a little bit about what Japan looked like at that time. Feudal Japan was com composed of regions that would develop into the prefectures that Japan has now. But at the time they were run by feudal lords that were called daimyo. So we'll get to those early combat arts in a second, but the unarmed combat arts that we will call jujitsu eventually start emerging in the 12th century when it's been known in, from feudal times under various names. They called it Yawara, they called it Kugosku, Kempo, Hakuda, Taijutsu, but the names Jujutsu and Yawara were the most widely known and used of these various different arts. There are at least 170, so when you say Ryu, and you'll hear that term throughout as a sort of suffix, it just means school. And so the samurai practiced a variety of arts and the grappling ones came from a variety of regional schools, which were called Ryu. We can document more than 170 different Ryu during the Japanese feudal period that we would eventually fall under the, uh, the, the rubric of jujitsu. So it's tough to generalize about what each style included because there were so many of them, but generally there was an emphasis on throwing because if you could get your opponent to the ground, you could dominate that person. <laughs> And there was an emphasis too. Samurai carried two weapons traditionally, the katana, long sword, and a wakazashi, a shorter blade. So the idea was you could throw somebody long enough to draw your wakazashi and finish the fight. The, it's widely accepted in a lot of the literature that the first instance of the martial art being taught in, in a form that we would recognize happens in 1532 with the Takanochi Ryu founded by Takanochi Hisamori. But it's also important to recognize that a lot of the texts that still exist are either really vague or they contradict each other. And so a lot of what we hear about early jujitsu is, is contradictory. There's a lot of murky uh, stuff here. Like I say, we're learning more about it all the time. But there's not a lot of information that you could consider definitive. And one of the reasons we know that a lot of this stuff was vague and unclear and a lot of the texts that exist in Japan either contradict each other or, or, or aren't definitive is that one of the central figures in our story spent a long time and a lot of energy investigating it. So this is Jiro Kano, and we will be talking about him a lot. So Kano was a Japanese patriot, an educator, and a major figure in Japanese history. I believe even if he had never founded judo, even if he'd never built the Kodokan, even if, he, if none of that stuff had ever happened, even, even if he'd never started doing martial arts, I still think he would be, be one of the most important Japanese figures of the last 150 years. Um, he loved his country, he loved his culture, but he also helped his country meet the world, and he did so through educational philosophy. And those philosophies, which you can see apply in judo and also the economics and the politics that he taught, was that education could develop mind, body, and spirit in equal proportion and could bring folks together. So over the course of his life, which we'll be talking about today, he will do just that. And Kano himself writes about the origins of jujitsu and how he 
And so I think it's important to understand how he understood this martial art when he starts training. He openly acknowledges, and I'm quoting here, and this is from something Cano himself wrote, the unreliableness of much of the literature of the art. Printed books on the subject are scarce, and while there are innumerable manuscripts belonging to various schools of the art, many of them are contradictory and unsatisfactory. The originators of new schools seem oftentimes to have made history to suit their own purposes. And so at this time, in the quote you see on your screen, the sort of story that is broadly told is that most martial arts are coming from China. And if you guys come over from China and they start to teach something that develops jujitsu. But to Kano, when he researched this, he, he said that as it is practiced in Japan, it's very dissimilar to how it is practiced in China. And that in that country, they do some kicking and striking. But the jujitsu that we're learning here in Japan involves much more. And so part of that is definitely truth in that they, the, but, but you can also see that as Kano sort of promoting his art as an indigenous Japanese martial art, something that we didn't get from elsewhere, certainly not from a powerful rival that's a mere few hundred miles away, but this is ours. And my research indicates that this art is ours. We'll get back to that in a second. We'll get back to Kano uh, for quite a bit of time tonight, but let's take a step back to a few hundred years before he was even born. So as I mentioned, in the 12th century, the samurai emerged. They're basically um, warriors from the upper class. And for a long time, Japan is a feudal regional society. So Oda Nobunaga is the first person to unify Japan and rule over the daimyo and become the shogun, which uh, is a term many of you have, have probably have probably heard. But when Nobunaga dies and his successor, Hideyoshi, subsequently dies in 1598, it leaves a power vacuum because Hideyoshi doesn't leave a strong successor. So the guy you see in the middle looking angry, Iyasu Tokugawa, moves to fill that power vacuum. And basically at the Battle of Sekigahara, he defeats the other regional lords, the daimyo, and unifies Japan. This will lead to the Tokugawa shogunate, which is the last shogunate of Japan, and they will rule for hundreds of years. So the, the, why, why does this matter? Because this sets the stage for a couple of really important events later. Japan is a closed society at that time until Commodore Matthew Perry, uh, not the guy from Friends, but a different guy, leads a crew of black ships on two voyages that sort of essentially through gunboat diplomacy forced Japan to open up to the outside world for trade. Of course, I'm compressing hundreds of years of history here, but that's the, the sort of high point. As that happens and Japan gets more open to the world, the feudal system begins collapsing and the, the sort of regional system just will not stand anymore. That matters to us for our story. And this is the part of Japan, the Japanese history that we call the Meiji Restoration, Emperor Meiji is restored. And it's a sort of renaissance in Japan. But why does this matter specifically for martial arts? It's because a lot of the funding for martial arts at the time, if you had a dojo, you probably were funded by your regional daimyo because it was in your interests as a regional lord to have a bunch of badasses that were fully trained to protect your regional area. And so after all of this feudal system collapses, there's not as much funding. And so folks end up, a lot of instructors end up out of work. And the reason this matters uh, is because they start doing, um, if you can't make a living teaching, you got to make a living performing. And so a lot of these guys start performing on these sort of barnstorming tours while they do demonstrations of jujitsu. Now, Kano himself finds that very distasteful, but it's still probably where he first saw what we would call jujitsu. And so this year of 1877 becomes really significant for a couple of reasons. The, the, the samurai warriors, which are actually still illegal at that point, and most of the samurai have been sublimated into like administrative roles in Japan. They do make one final stand, a pretty suicidal charge, where under a guy named Saigo Takamori, who was the daimyo of Satsuma in southern Japan, they rise up and are destroyed utterly on the battlefield. And uh, at that same time, that same year, Kano starts training jujitsu. And so I see it as sort of a changing of the guard here. We'll talk more about how Kano came to train on the next slide, but what I what but but that's a really significant, I think, turning point in our story. Five years later, he'll has formally established Kodokan Judo, and then later, uh, the Russo-Japanese War will break out, which spreads interest in Jiu-Jitsu. We're going to do deeper dives on each of those big four bullet points in in the bit, but in a minute. But just keep those dates in your head, or don't, you know, because there's a presentation on the screen, whatever. So, guys, that is Jiro Kano, and he begins training in 1877. Here's how he comes to train. He's the youngest of five children, and he wants to train martial arts for many reasons. For one thing, he's really interested in Japanese cultural heritage, and for another thing, he's five foot two, and he's being bullied. But his father considers martial arts outdated and useless, 
And so Cano's only five foot two inches tall at full grown. And when he begins at 17 years old, he goes out to seek an instructor. And one thing that I think is, is sort of funny here, because it, it reminds me of a story uh, of a Henzo Gracie story, is that he goes first, and he, he writes about this, Cano does. He goes first looking for an instructor because he doesn't know exactly where to go. He goes looking for bone setters because a lot of guys that used to teach jujitsu and used to break bones professionally have now become bone setters. And so he runs into one of these guys, visits a bone setters clinic, and uh, Tenosuke Yagi uh, introduces him to who will become his first instructor, Hachinosuke Fukuda. Now, Fukuda is a teacher under the Tenjin Shinro, Shinyo Ryu style under Hachinosuke, or sorry, un, who, it, under Mata, Mata Emon Iso. And that's in 1877. So at this time, Kano is a 17 year old student at Tokyo Imperial University, and he'll train for the next two years. He'll also have a run of bad luck in terms of his instructor's health, or maybe he was bad luck, I don't know. But two years later, um, his instructor Fukuda and a 19-year-old Kano give a demonstration for President Ulysses S. Grant. And just a few days later, Fukuda dies. Uh, suddenly and unexpectedly, he's in his early 50s. So uh, Fukuda's widow asks Kano, who's only been training for a couple of years, to take over the dojo. And even then, he has the humility to sort of understand that he doesn't have enough training to teach. And so instead, he goes to train with uh, Mataemon Iso's son, Masamoto. Now, the significance of these places is that there are already some jujitsu schools who have gone more kata style, just ex to, to train forms. Whereas both Fukuda and Iso have a lot of emphasis on sparring. And Kano tells some lovely stories about how when he first shows up at Fukuda's place, Fukuda just throws him over and over and just will make him come up. No, come at me again. Throws him over and over. Which, you know, it, those of you that have been training more than 10 years, it probably reminds me of how you started training because it sure reminds me of how I started training. But unlike a lot of the schools that, that Kano could have ended up in, he ends up in a lot of, in, in a couple of schools with some, some live training. So unfortunately, just a couple of years later, Masamoto Iso himself dies. And so Kano moves on to train at a Kitoryu school, learning from a guy named Tsunetoshi Ikubo, who's also known as Kuna, Konan Ikubo. So this is significant because it's probably where Kano starts using the term judo, because the Kitoryu originally in the 17th century has focused on throws in full armor, but had been evolved into a more philosophical discipline by this time because the samurai are no longer around. The thing that these schools all have in common, once again, is the sparring or what the judo folks will come to call randori. Um, so here's the thing. At this time, the terms jujitsu and judo are often used sort of interchangeably. As you'll see later, Ju Kodokan judo is often referred to as, ko as kano jujitsu to sort of identify it with him, not by him, but by other people who will, who will call it that. And those terms are sometimes used kind of interchangeably. So Kito Ryu, at the time that Kano starts training with them, has been using the term judo for about 150 years. And we talked about this terminology in the first session, but I'll repeat it for some of you folks who weren't here. So jutsu arts are generally fighting arts, which is like the practical, we are doing this for practical purpose of fighting. Whereas do arts, Aikido, are arts that mean like the way, which is it, it, you know, more for personal development, more, more for education. And that is something that certainly comports with Kano himself, because he believes very much in martial arts for personal development and education. And cultural stuff as well. So when Kano founds the Kodokan in 1882, he really believes in preserving Japanese jujitsu as a Japanese cultural treasure. So during this time, he attempts to train with as many classical schools of jujitsu as he can to preserve knowledge. You can see a cool photo of him there in the center in the middle with, uh, in roughly 1921 with a bunch of other old masters. So it should be noted that during this time and for decades after, these old masters are dying. So Kano is really trying to preserve that knowledge. And you, I don't know if you'll be able to read the uh, the text on the far left, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it is, which is, uh, unfortunately, knowledge is always lost, right? You know, we it, it's the Library of Alexandria problem. You can try and reconstruct what was there, but without really careful efforts to preserve, it, it's going to be lost. And so a book is published called The Complete Kano Jiu-Jitsu. And Kano himself uh, writes an, a, an inscription. This is from 
that book where he's written in it that says this book, it says, it, this book says the complete Kano Jiu-Jitsu, but unfortunately, this is the teaching of the Jiu-Jitsu from feudal times that is now obliterated in Japan. So for all his efforts to really preserve as much as he can, he feels like a lot of that knowledge is lost, unfortunately. But it's worth noting, and I think this will be a theme of Kano's career, that he, uh, he really... Uh, lives by the, the Dave Camarillo maximum of train with everyone. And so he'll train to learn techniques. He'll train to preserve techniques. Uh, this is a fun uh, uh, image from the Tenjin Shinyo Ryu uh, manual here on the right that you can see. One incident that he mentions in, in one of his books is that while he's under Masamoto Ito's tutelage, he witnesses a demonstration by a guy named Totsuka Hikosuke. And he takes part in Randori with their schools. And this experience leads him to believe that in order to really, truly become superior, you need to combine the best elements of several schools of jujitsu. And so he will, like, un unlike a lot of instructors that are super close-minded in terms of both learning and teaching with other schools, Kano's not like that. And I think that the, the, that shows his background as an educator because it will also cross cultural, racial, and geographic lines. So here's a fun thing. And... Uh, you know, a lot of us that train in either older school or middler school environments know that there's there's some sort of loyalty stuff. Everybody knows the term crayonche. But when you joined the Kodakon, you had to actually swear an oath of allegiance to the Kodakon. And these the, it changes from 1882 to 1884. This is the 1882 version. But I think this is this is pretty revelatory of the mindset at the time. From this day forth, I promise to persevere in judo and shall not quit training for any frivolous reason. It even if I get a blue belt, I think is implied there. I shall not bring dishonor on the Kodakon. Something like that happens later, which is one of my favorite early fight stories. That's foreshadowing. I promise I will not divulge to others any of the secret arts of judo by visual and verbal means. I shall not instruct others without authorization, which is somewhat ironic as we'll, as we'll get into in a second. And I shall abide by all the rules of Kodakon judo, both before and after receiving a judo teacher's license. So so this is kind of hardcore, right? But Kano admits in his book that he doesn't strictly require the oath. So from May to December in 1882, which is the first year he founds the Kodakon, he has about 20 some regular students. Of those, only nine sign the oath. They revise the oath in 1884, but the majority of students still don't sign it. It looks like it looks like it's about 50-50 whether people would sign this or not. And I don't know, you know, I'm learning more about this myself. And so I wonder if that created any kind of interesting divisions in the gym. One other note on terminology. Kano also writes about why he names the school the Kodokan, because the root words essentially mean the place where the art of judo is taught, or the institute for the art of judo. And he writes about how he, he considered other names, and how because he wanted to teach judo, that's why he named it this. If he were going to teach a martial art generally, he would have named the school Renbukan, which just means Institute for Martial Arts Practice, or Shobukan, Military Institute. And so he has a book called uh, Judo Memoirs of Jigoro Kano that I recommend for that. We hear a lot of stuff from the horse's mouth. So let's talk a little bit about the timeline here, because the arc of Kano's life is preserving martial arts, advancing martial arts, and educating society for mutual welfare and mutual benefit. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a journey at first, because a lot of martial arts schools are out of business due to the collapse of the feudal system. A lot of folks, including Kano's own father, think jujitsu is outdated. Like, why would you want to learn that stuff? And there's a lot of education that has to take place with the Japanese government to make them understand why what he's doing is valuable. So he believes in the martial arts ability to contribute to moral and, and physical development, but th these views are not in fashion at the time. In 1884, the Japanese Ministry of Education considers jujitsu and other budo arts too dangerous, violent, and individualistic to be taught in schools. Kano will be a, a strong advocate for his whole life of martial arts in schools, and spoiler alert, eventually he wins. But at the time, it was an uphill slog, uh, starting in 1884. Kano is also in the minority in another way. When the Sino-Japanese War breaks out in 1894, Kano opposes the war, as he will most of the wars that Japan gets into in his lifetime. The two countries are fighting over the sphere of influence in Asia, particularly Korea. And although Kano opposes the war, he's really in the minority in the elite circles that he runs in. J Japanese nationalism is going to be on the rise for most of the next 60 years and most of Kano's life, and with wide-ranging consequences that pretty much all of us know about what we'll talk about later. Most of the other mainland martial artists are actually on the other side, like Morihei Ueshiba, who is the founder of Aikido. Uh, a lot of these guys were ultra-nationalists and members of the Japanese far right. 
And we can talk about that more after we talk about some of the other characters. So I have some other interesting little, it, it, we'll talk about timelines in a second too, but here you see the first challenge matches for the Kodakan start in about 1885. The first foreign students who will say more about start training shortly thereafter. And Ikubo Kano's uh, uh, Kitoryu teacher dies in 1889. The reason that's significant is that uh, uh, part of why Kano doesn't start promoting Kodakan Judo as much as, as he probably wants to, is out of respect for his teacher. Uh, but after after Ikubo dies, he starts to promote Kodokan Juno in earnest. And for those of you uh, jujitsu uh, jiu -jitsu dudes who want to know about Count Koma, who we'll talk about more next Tuesday, Mitsuyo Maeda begins training at the Kodokan in 1897. So let's talk about some fun stuff, competition and challenges. So Shiro Saigo here on the left is one of the earliest and most badass members of the Kodokan. He is one of the first two black belts that, that Kano uh, promotes. Uh, he promotes those guys, uh, Sunajiro Tomita, who's there in the center, along with Saigo in 1883. By the way, he promotes those guys before the Kitoryu give him a professorial diploma. Uh, so he's promoting them in Kodokan Judo, not in Kitoryu Jiu-Jitsu, just so you know. So Saigo is a really fun dude to think about. He's a beast. He's short, but he's stocky. He's uh, He really enjoys alcohol and he really enjoys challenge matches. And what happens to him very much illustrates Kano's teaching and competition philosophy in my view. So he and Tamita are the very are the first black belts that are given. On, on the day of their graduation, Saigo accepts a challenge match with this guy, Sakajiro Yokoyama, who's much heavier. And he beats him, which is great. He'll be one of the most prominent um, Kodokan challenge match guys. Also, when the East Lake brothers, who are the first foreigners to train at the Kodokan, and they're big white dudes, Saigo, who's a, a, I think 5'3", throws both of them easily. This becomes really powerful testament to the, the power of the techniques that Kano is teaching. In 1884 and 1885, Saigo also wins challenge matches against much larger opponents from the Yoshin Ryu, a rival jiu-jitsu school, leading one of their instructors to call Saigo a genius. So he's really prominent, very good at what he does. He actually has a, uh, a throw of his own uh, called the Yama Arashi, which there's a similar throw that, that exists now, but like apparently it's a different throw. And uh, because Tomita says that when Saigo died, that, that technique died out, but apparently he could do it to just about everybody. So what's fun about this, and, and by fun, I mean, well, so I don't know about y'all, but I love a good fight story. And so here's, imagine your top guy. At your, at your school, the guy, the, the mat enforcer, the guy that can beat up everybody. Saigo is basically that guy. So one night he's out drinking alcohol, enjoying himself, having fun with his life. And he runs into a sumo wrestler named Aorumi. And they fight because that's what you do at that time. And Saigo throws him. Cool. No worries. Had a friendly little challenge. I threw you. No, no big deal. So Aorumi bites Saigo's leg. And at that point, I don't know if your mat enforcer is like this, but I think we've all known dudes that we've trained with that now it's on. And so he starts throwing all of the sumo guys entourage. And so he's not just throwing the one sumo guy, he's throwing them all. So then the police are called and they arrive and they find this drunken judo badass. So Saigo does the only thing that you could do, the only logical thing, which is he starts throwing the cops. He throws at least two of the cops into the river. And uh, eventually though, you know, either he gets tired or maybe they swarm him and eventually they take him down and arrest him and take him to jail. The person who bails him out of jail is, of course, Jigoro Kano, who unfortunately boots him from the Kodokan and throws him out for street fighting. And to me, this shows a lot about the sort of break in, in martial arts thinking and where, what who Kano was as a person. Because this was one of his top guys, maybe his top guy. But he was like, it can't be associated with this. And he never trains at the Kodokan again. He posthumously, he isn't promoted again until Kano uh, posthumously awards him his sixth dan after he dies. And so something of a sad story, but also a fun fight story. And also kind of shows you uh, the type of person Kano was, where even, even the best guy is not exempt from, from the rules of the Kodokan. Challenge matches are important at this time, and they help develop Kodokan techniques and renown. So after Saigo goes too far, we start to hear about Mate Meon Tanabe. And this is funny. Me and Mike were talking. Some of you may have heard me and me and Mike Rogers talking before we, we started recording about um, Henzo Gracie's book, Mastering Jiu Jitsu, which has a foreword by John Donaher. And Donaher talks about the Fusen Ryu. 
And I'll, uh, you know, I always want to be as transparent as I possibly can. We're learning more about this stuff at any given time. So many of you may have heard these stories and these stories are very tough to like, I'll tell you when the, 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 there are some stories that are really tough to verify and other stories that are pretty verifiable. So in, in that book, Danaher tells a story that I heard repeated that is sort of oral tradition that the Kodagan had a challenge, had challenge matches and the Fusen Ryu, the Jiu-Jitsu style that focused on Nawaza, gave them a ton of trouble on the ground and even started winning this sort of what we would call a dual meet in wrestling. And they, they, they won these challenge matches. Now, like I've been talking to Robert Drysdale a lot during the, the course of this, and it's tough to verify like if these challenge matches happened, like what they looked like, um, whether they happened as reported, but a couple of things are clear. Um, the Fusen Ryu was really good on the ground in what we would call, what we call Nawaza. Um, and the best of them was Mate Montanabe. And he is sort of, you, you can't really find, or at least I couldn't find real hard verifiable evidence that a lot of Fusen Ryu students regularly beat Kodakan students, but you can find some very some some really verifiable information about Tanabe throwing and defeating Kodakan students. And so it may be that he was just, I mean, it, you know, it's pretty clear that he was one of the top grapplers, particularly one of the top Nawaza grapplers at the time. And the sort of, and even if the sort of Fusen Ryu generally is overblown, which it may or may not be, I just don't have enough information to say for sure. You can definitely say that Tanabe was one of the most dangerous ground grapplers at the time. In 1900, in front of the crown prince of Japan, he footlocks a Kodokan student, which allows Kano, which, which causes Kano to, I suspect somewhat grudgingly, ask Tanabe to come to the Kodokan and start and teach some of his, his students. Now, this wouldn't be out of character for Kano. Kano would invite all kinds of instructors that he was impressed with. And I'll give you some more examples later. But the reason this is significant, and I've sort of uh, talked around this, is that Kano was very much more of a tachiwaza, a throwing, standing techniques person than a newaza person. He actually said in a direct quote, human beings were made to walk, not crawl. And so in his view, the ideal judo would train about 70% on the feet and only about 30% on the ground. And it wasn't until Tanabe, and maybe some of the other Fusen Ryu guys too, you know, started demonstrating the value of Nawaza that the Kodokan starts focusing on Nawaza. Even Mitsuyo Maeda will talk about how he didn't train much Nawaza at the Kodokan. And we're, we're learning more about that at this time too. Tanabe is a fun figure. He's also this dude in the awesome top hat. And uh, yeah, so let's talk a little bit. So I've talked about the Kodokan. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on in Japan at the time, which sort of sets the stage for future development of jujitsu. So J the collapse of the feudal system causes a collapse in the rural economies in Japan. Particularly in Okinawa, there's also sugar prices that are collapsing. And so exports like sugarcane, people are having a hard time making a living. And so the Japanese government, due to overpopulation and economic crisis, starts advertising for emigration. Like, hey, why don't we all go to Brazil? Take the whole family. Look at this economic opportunity that exists here in South America for you. This starts happening. Uh, the immigration begins in earnest in uh, 1908. And Brazil actually issued a commemorative stamp, which is here on the right, 80 years of Brazilian immigration from Japan. So all of this is sort of the, the social context of what's happening. So the first Japanese immigrants begin arriving in Brazil in 1908. One of those, uh, uh, Sada Miyako will become probably the first jujitsu instructor in Brazil. But we're focusing on Japan, so that's the story of another time. We'll talk about the other places that the Japanese diaspora goes uh, next Tuesday. And so if you're interested in that, come on back and we'll have some fun with that. So here's a happy thing with a cute photo of some cute children. So I mentioned as early as in 1894, Kano and probably some other allies try to get martial arts in public schools as a required course. But this government report that the Ministry of Education drops is not, uh, yeah, they're not in favor of it. Too violent, too dangerous for school age youth, too individualistic. But Kano doesn't give up. His career is as an educator. And I want to talk about that just for a second. Um, let's talk about him as an educator and how that did and did not overlap with judo. So he promoted martial arts whenever he could. But remember, he was in college to become a teacher. He became an instructor of political science and finance and economics at Gakushuin in 1882, which was his first job as an educator. In 1885, he became a full professor as well as an administrator. The following year, he got promoted again. 
He also becomes the director of primary education for the Japanese Ministry of Education and then becomes the president of the Tokyo Higher Normal School from 1900 until 1920. That is one of the oldest universities in Japan. It's now called the University of Tsukuba. So the, I mentioned this for a couple of reasons. I said before that even if Kano had never trained, he would still be an extremely important figure in modern Japan. He's, he's definitely the father of modern physical education in Japan and probably the father of modern music education in Japan. It's him, possibly because of influence by Confucian thinking, that gets music as a required curriculum in Japanese primary school and middle school. And in, eight, in 1908, he finally achieves a decades-long objective when the Japanese diet, which is the parliament, requires either judo or kendo for middle school students. And this really shows you the shift of, from a few decades when jujitsu and judo were sort of thought of this antiquated relics from a bygone era that you couldn't make a living at, to these really important things that were good for your personal development, your moral development, as well as your, as well as your physical development. So that's a real victory for Kano, and I would say a victory for Japan. Japanese people aren't the only one training at this time. Let's talk about some of the first Westerners to train. And you know that, that, that's pretty exciting. I've mentioned that Kano has always been what, and we'll get into this later too, a globalist or a cosmopolitan, someone that believes that we should spread judo to the world for, uh, because he believes judo principles can benefit the world and bring people together. So his passion teaching judo and spreading it around the world starts at the Kodokan, including with the first Westerners. Um, the most important of these, I think, is the guy in the middle, Alan Corstoffer Smith. But the first is a guy named David T. Weed. He's the son of an American father and a Japanese mother who becomes the first American black belt, first Western black belt in 1910. Uh, there were brothers that trained before, but they didn't earn Shodan uh, or, or beyond. Now, Smith becomes the fifth Westerner, and he's the first Scotsman to be graded Shodan. He gets graded Shodan in 1916. Even though he's a Scot, he moves to the United States and becomes a U.S. Army captain. That's him flexing, stunting on him, even though Instagram won't be invented for another 100 years. That's what he's looking like. Right, And this is right after he got tested for his black belt, that 1916 photo. The photo on the right is from a book that he will write. Um, he, After he becomes a U.S. Army captain, he teaches judo-based combatives at Fort Benning in the years 1917 and 1918. A couple years later, he authors a book about judo and jiu-jitsu techniques in 1920. And that figure six there where he's wrist locking that guy, you knew I had to include a wrist lock photo. Those of you that train with me, you know that I had to include a wrist lock photo. Um, so that's from that book. And a bunch of pictures from that book are online. And so I really encourage you to check that out because you'll see a lot of fun stuff. You'll see a lot of stu stuff that we still do today. And, uh, and, you know, it, it, so it's sort of interesting to see how the art sort of um, evolved from there. The last person I want to talk about is uh, John O'Brien. And, uh, you know, we know who the first five black belts were. But I want to talk about John O'Brien, who did not uh, train at the Kodokan or get a black belt from, from Kano. But he's important because went to Nagasaki in the U.S. Navy for about four years. He was a police officer that was specifically tasked with crimes committed by foreigners or gaijin. And he starts training jujitsu there. The reason he's important is he'll return to the U.S. and he'll be the first uh, the first person to show jujitsu to President Theodore Roosevelt. So some those are some of the earliest Westerners that we know of that were training at the Kodokan at that time. So here's the thing, y'all. You know, I used to live in Okinawa, so you know I got to talk about Okinawa. But trust me, it's important. Speaking of foreigners and Kano's role spreading judo throughout the world, let's talk about Okinawa. Now, some of y'all may or may not know this, but Okinawa uh, was its own independent kingdom, the kingdom of the Ryukyus, before it was colonized by China and Japan. And so much like Hawaii, it doesn't become a part of the political state of Japan, just like Hawaii didn't become a part of the political state of the U.S. until the 19th century. And so Okinawans are ethnically, culturally, and linguistically distinct from Japanese. Uh, they have their own language, they call themselves Uchinanchu. Um, fascinating, amazing culture. And the island is the birthplace of karate. So I want to talk about this because both of, I think it shows you a bit of who Kano was as a person. And it also shows you a little bit about how martial arts developed. So there were some exchanges in the arts. So Kano visits, Japan, visits Okinawa in 1927, but well before that, um, judo starts to spread there. The first recorded judo dojo in Okinawa opens actually in 1899. And Kano become, becomes friends with the guy in the center there, Gichin Funakoshi. Funakoshi's pen name is Shoto, which is why the art that he founded is called Shotokan. And uh, he will eventually, he and Kano strike up a friendship. Um, Funakoshi is credited with being uh, the person who brought karate to mainland Japan. 
he deserves as much credit as anybody, but there were other people involved in that story too. But him and Cano's friendship generates a lot of interesting cultural exchange. Cano invites a crew of Shuri, which is the capital of Okinawa, uh, middle school students to the Kodokan in 1911. So a bunch of Okinawan kids come to the Kodokan in 1911. When Funakoshi visits the mainland and he eventually moves to Tokyo in 1922, Kano helps him set up teaching opportunities, teaching his karate. In 1922, Funakoshi adopts Kano's belt system. So before that, there was no real karate belt system. And so Funakoshi essentially has an idea exchange there. And so the first karate belts aren't awarded until 1924. When Kano visits Okinawa in 1927, he's really impressed, not just with Funakoshi's students, but with this guy on the far right, Chojun Miyagi's students. Chojun Miyagi is the founder of a style called Goju Ryu. And uh, it's important too, and uh, to stick a pin in this, at this time, these two men's Okinawan style karate includes throws, it includes pins, it includes joint locks, and it includes grounds, groundwork as well as weapons defense. That's not really true anymore because sport karate has sort of had those martial arts evolve in a bit of a different direction. But at this time, karate is very, very much an alive self-defense art. So he's so impressed, Kano is, that he brings Miyagi to Japan, to the mainland for a demonstration at the Kodokan. So Miyagi goes and teaches at the Kodokan. He performs and teaches at various tournaments around Japan, along with another guy named Kenwa Mabuni. And uh, Mabuni is another really important Okinawan moving to Japan at the time. He'll, uh, he'll move in 1929. But to me, this shows Kano's open-mindedness both as a martial artist and as an educator committed to cultural exchange. At the time, Okinawans aren't even considered really Japanese, and their art, karate, is considered to be this sort of Chinese-influenced thing that, that mainland Japanese are not super into. But to Kano, learning this art and helping these people advance their own, you know, he would, I'm reminded of the line from Chaucer, and he would gladly learn and he would gladly teach. So I think that really speaks well of him. Kano also knew something that I think is significant, and I might be putting words in his, in his deceased mouth here, but Kano also knew firsthand about the experience that live training could do and could lead to effective martial arts. And I want to talk about that in the, in the effect of karate because jujitsu guys, uh, as jujitsu guys, karate gets a bad rap with us sometimes, somewhat unfairly. So I want to talk about at least one guy that you recognize. And you probably recognize the guy on the bottom. That's Lyoto Machida. He used to be the UFC champion. The guy on top is his dad, Yoshi, Yoshizo Machida, who moved to Brazil in 1968. So Yoshizo is an eighth degree Shotokan black belt. And check out this quote from him. Over the last several decades, karate has lost core effectiveness as a method of street self-defense due to the emphasis most schools place on point-based sportive tournaments. Machida Karate, which still exists down in Brazil, is committed to preserving the integrity of the art by teaching the techniques and philosophies that ensure karate's effectiveness where it matters most. Remember, Funikoshi and all those guys taught throws, pins, joint locks, grappling, all that sort of stuff. So when uh, Lyoto's dad moved to Brazil, he got Lyoto not into his own karate, not just into his own karate school, but also into the jiu-jitsu that was, was being taught at the time. So Lyoto came up training old school karate and incorporating takedowns and submissions, as well as the, you know, in, the, in, in Salvador. I mentioned this because arts evolve based on priorities. And when the priorities are sportive priorities, like point fighting, touching, you're going to get very good at point fighting, but you're not going to necessarily be very good at martial effectiveness. Whereas it's easy to say, well, karate doesn't work. Well, it absolutely does if you're doing it in a live fashion with trained jujitsu black belts who are trying to, trying to do harm to you. And so it doesn't really matter what you call it. If the art is alive, it can work at the highest level. I also want you to check out the Machida Karate Gis and compare them to what Okinawans were wearing at the time, what Kano and other judoka were wearing, and what Maeda was wearing at the time. These are what Gis used to look like, folks. And I want to mention that the, the Valencia Brothers School down in um, – Miami, they still wear geese that look a lot like this. Idea being it's a bit more uh, of a, an effective proxy for the clothes that people actually wear. I'm also just going to start rocking it around downtown Bellingham because it will make me look good. Damn good. So let's talk a little bit more about the timeline here. And uh, hang in, folks. We're getting near the end, so I appreciate your patience. So at this point, uh, let's talk about what happens between the wars. And by between the wars, I mean between the Sino-Japanese War and when World War II starts. So Kano, the Japanese patriot, 
opposes both wars, but he's deeply in the, in the minority, even in the circles that he runs in. Many of his students are disciples of a dude named Mitsuru Toyama, who's an ultra-nationalist and the founder of a thing called Genyosha. In fact, one of the Kodokan students, this guy down in the lower left, Ryohei Ochida, is an ultra-nationalist who founds the Black Dragon Society, which is a Japanese imperialist group. And Japanese nationalism is on the rise, and it'll culminate in not just uh, attacks in the region, but in the Second World War. Now, Kano is not down with that. Kano believes in solving international problems through judo principles of mutual well being and prosperity through application of focused effort. Critics called Kano at the time a globalist, along with his political uh, ally, who was a guy named Kimochi Sayonji. His political ally, Sayonji, was so detested by these militarists, he was on the list of people to be assassinated in the attempted coup in 1936. Don't worry, though, he survives. So, the reason I mention all this is that all of this is sort of the political backdrop. And one of the things that Kano wants to do to sort of spread mutual understanding is to help bring the Olympics to Tokyo in 1940. So he starts lobbying and he's in sort of an interesting position because you, he's, he's, he's at best ambivalent about his beloved art of judo in the Olympics for reasons that we'll get into on the next slide. But he really believes that judo with, or the, not, not the judo, but the, the Olympics will bring people together for common purpose, will lead to cultural exchange, and will lead to the kinds of things that promote mutual understanding. And, and mu as I mentioned, mutual welfare and benefit, which you, you hear a lot in his philosophy of judo. So unfortunately, well, uh, well, we, everybody knows that World War II happened, so you know how the story ends. But I'm still trying to keep you guys in some measure of suspense. So from 1931 to 1938, Kano becomes one of the leading international spokesmen in Japan's bid for the Olympics, but not just for judo's sake, for the sake of uniting people under a common cause. I'm going to read you, not this quote on the screen, but I'm going to read you uh, one of Kano's opinions about judo in the Olympics. Judo in reality is not a mere sport or game. I regard it as a principle of life, art, and science. It is a means for per personal cultural attainment. Only one of the forms of judo training, the so-called randori, can be classed as a form of sport. In addition, the Olympic games are strongly flavored with nationalism. So it is possible to be influenced by it and develop contest jujitsu as a re or judo as a retrograde form of jujitsu from before the Kodokan was founded. He was worried that by making judo just a sport on a stage like the Olympics, that that would influence judo in a negative way. Nevertheless, he still wanted to bring the Olympics to Japan because he believed in the Olymp the, this, this sort of common cause sport uh, aspect, you know, to build international understanding. So he believes the Olympic Games might bring humanity together, even as he's worried about how sport rules will impact judo. But in this pre-war climate, it's easy to see why, why he'd think the risk was worth it. So that is the work he is doing when he unfortunately dies in 1938. He's on a boat trip when he dies lobbying for the Olympics. That's 1938. The very next year, 1939, Hitler invades Poland and the world's at war. In that same year, in a pretty gnarly symbolic action, a bronze statue of Kano outside of Tokyo University, which is on this slide right here, gets melted down to aid in Japan's war effort. It's hard to read that as anything more than a posthumous slap in the face from the nation that he had tried to save. So I got sort of bummed out when I was reading that. But here's the thing. The war ends in 1945. The Kano statue is recast in the 50s because they sort of recognize how important he is. And uh, I admit that the rising sun on this slide is kind of ironic. But hey, Japan is far from free from problems from today, but it is a peaceful, stable democracy. Judo is an Olympic sport, and it's improved the lives of hundreds of thousands of people and provided the basis for Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Wars don't end stories. They just interrupt them. And... From my perspective, I'm with Kano. Judo and Jiu-Jitsu can bring us together. I'm going to leave you with one last Kano quote, and then I'd be thrilled to answer any questions y'all had. And if anybody else has anything they want to bring up, be thrilled for that as well. Last Kano quote. Paradoxically, the man who has failed and one who is at the peak of success are in exactly the same position. Each must decide what he will do next. Choose the course that will lead him to the future. Kano was a giant of a man, guys. He did everything he could to save the country that he loved from disaster. He did everything he could to spread martial arts, mutual benefit, and welfare to countries all around the world. But win or lose, he recognized that every day is a choice. And if you ask me, Kano chose well. So I want to say thanks for listening. If you have any questions, that's my email address. We can also uh, hit, hit me up with questions after this. 
want to acknowledge that this presentation wouldn't be possible without Jose Tufikairus, without Roberto Pedrera, Robert Drysdale, John Stevens. Please buy their books. Please go see their movies. Please, Chuck, take German off the back of your screen. That's freaking me out. And please, <laughs> start, and please, uh, and please watch Close Guard the movie when it comes out. If you want to see my references for this talk, those are at bellinghambjj.com. I want to throw in another plug that Richard at Marshall History Team has a great blog post today about whether Cano had a PhD, a lot of cool history stuff. You can check out at that blog. Um, you guys, jujitsu and judo are martial arts that we co-create every day. It's an honor to be on this journey with y'all. Thank you for putting up with me for an hour. You guys are awesome, and I would be thrilled to take any questions you guys have. I'll start with my first question. Uh, fantastic, by the way. Um, I took judo. I was fortunate as a long, long, long ago. Um, but I remember as a as as a child, them telling us about a, a significant uh, match between the Kodokan. Uh, judokas versus the uh, Tokyo Police Academy um, and doing um, regular jujitsu. Did that figure anywhere in your history? So this is a great question. And what's awesome is I'm going to give you a teaser. So if you read, uh, so one of the main books that, that I used for this presentation was uh, John Stevens' The Way of Judo, a portrait of Jigoro Kano and his students. And he describes some of that. But the last time I talked to Robert Drysdale and Drysdale was interviewed on my podcast and another podcast where Drysdale just says that didn't happen. And I, I, and I trust Drysdale. He's an amazing historical researcher. I don't know what his, I don't know what his reasoning for that is. I do know that a lot of, you know, a lot of times like with any kind of marketing stories you either get exaggerated or maybe you play up the stuff that's beneficial to you. Uh, but the, it is described in the Stevens book as well as in some other some other books. But Drysdale says that he's found evidence that it just didn't happen. And I would tell you that evidence, but I don't know it. So all I can say is go see Closed Guard. Interesting, interesting. Thank you. Yeah, man. Richard, by the way, if you have anything to, to add on any of that stuff, please don't hesitate to jump in if you know some stuff that I don't about that. Yeah, just about that. There is a good article. I'm trying to find it now by this guy named Wayne Morimoto, who probably has the best research of that. And I think the consensus is that there were a series of contests. Nobody's really sure exactly. Like some people will say there was one in 1885 or there was one in 1886. And uh, some people say that was the defining moment for the Kodokan. But it's more likely that there were probably a series of contests and something happened. I, I don't think... Um, like kind of was pretty good about saying that things happened. He might get some dates wrong or he might misremember some details, but I've never really come across anything where it was blatantly like he was making something up. So right. he, you know, got some dates wrong, but I think something did happen or a series of events happened. Yeah. And that's the other thing. Like the, 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 other, the other thing about that is that sometimes, and this is true of all humans, memories are weird things. And so sometimes, and, and, but we love simple stories, right? And so, I'll, and I'll give you another example from Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is a lot of us came up hearing the story. Well, uh, Oswaldo Fada guys went to the Gracie gym and they tapped them all with foot locks and, and that's how, and, and then you go back and you, you read it and it's very difficult to find evidence for that. You can find evidence of challenge matches where, okay, there were 10 matches and the Fada guys won two or three. And one of those was a foot lock. And, and, you know, and it's of course possible that these things happen and we just don't have the evidence for them. But what I think is likely is a lot of times these stories get aggregated in our mind. And so there are, you know, people get dates confused or it's like, maybe there are five challenge matches and like Steve footlocked this guy in 1942. And then the next year, Danny footlocked this other guy, but in, in your, in your brain, it becomes like, oh yeah, those guys just footlocked those other guys. And uh, so so it's and that's why it's fun and interesting to do this research to sort of find out and the other example is like what i said in the presentation with tanabe is that in in the danaher forward to henzo's book danaher's like yeah the fushin you guys just tooled these guys up on the ground and then you do the research and you read the herberto padrera books and you read the stevens books and you're like okay there were definitely challenge matches but it's tough to find one challenge match date where that happened as described and mostly just you hear oh tanabe whooped somebody's ass <laughs> and, uh, and so 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 yeah that was a bit of a digression but but like that's the kind of thing where these happen is that stories you know sometimes it's just yes this happened exactly as reported sometimes it's like okay it happened but not at the right date like for example a couple different sources um say that uh fukuda kano's first instructor died right before the grant demonstration, but Kano himself says that it happened after. And so 
sometimes people get confused about dates and that happens too. Yeah, we were taught back in the day that it was 1886. So it, it was very definitive. So. Well, like, the, and I will say this, like uh, Herbert Pedrero's book, Craze, like there's like has some like and there are multiple dates that that he talks about but there are I, i'm with richard like something like that happened but we don't but like whether it was you know hey we're here do you want to train or whether it was like a tournament you know I, I'm, I'm just not really sure about but pedrera has some stuff about that happening in 1886 too i have a question yeah <laughs> yes sir um, Kano seems like a really gentle and thoughtful guy. Why are judoka so mean? So here's the thing: just because he was a gentle and thoughtful dude, don't don't think for a second that guy wasn't a bad dude. Like uh, if you read some of the accounts of them training back in the day, like they they trained like savages, and they they um and and that to be honest, those are the people that I admire the most, like the cultural savages who are like, hey, I'm gonna go to my job as a professor and I'm gonna teach the youth and I'm gonna contribute to moral development of society, and then I'm gonna throw you on your head and I'm gonna arm lock you before you know what's going on. And so, like, I really do encourage like the the if you read like the um Cano's like some of Cano's own words, like one of the one of the uh, one of the subtitle subtitles of his of one of his books is Pain is a Great Teacher. And the, the other, so, so, you know, badasses are not all like the people I admire the most are nice, thoughtful, intelligent, humble badasses, which is what I think Kano was. So, but I will answer your question in a different way, which may, and maybe your question was, was meant to be purely whimsical, but I will say that rule sets drive behaviors. And so one of the things that you have to remember is that particularly with Kano, he, he wanted, he was a big fan of Tachiwaza more so than Newaza, which is why in a lot of even modern judo competitions, like you win by throwing. And if we let you grapple on the ground, it's gonna be for a limited period. And unless you can submit a guy very quickly, it's it's not worth as much as a nice epon throw where you can just win, right? And so if that happens, like that incentivizes people in sparring to be quick, be explosive, be, you know, to attack, attack, attack. And so, and that's one of the things that I find really interesting. You could also say the same about wrestlers versus jujitsu guys. You know, jujitsu guys can be aggressive too, of course, but like if the rule set is Mike and Jeff are going to go grapple and there is no time limit and one of them will submit eventually, I don't have a lot of incentive to be horrifically mean and just try to like shake you and throw you because I'm going to wear myself out. It's better for me to like be tactical. Whereas if it's like, okay, Mike, you have three minutes, uh, you know, in a wrestling match or like once the fight hits the mat, it's less than a minute you are incentivized to go like a madman. And, uh, and so I do, I do think, and this, and, you know, so it, that sort of depends on whether you're training for self-defense, whether you're training for, for competitions and stuff. And so I do think competition rule sets because people are competitive and it sort of drives behaviors. That's my answer. Anyhow, plus I know a lot of nice judoka. Hey Jeff, I've got a question. Yeah, Bob. So you'd mentioned that jujitsu kind of came to global prominence um, after the Russo-Japanese War. Is there any indication that jujitsu as a philosophy played itself out during that conflict? Like in the, because you could sort of see it as a metaphor or a representative of jujitsu, like the, the czarist Russia crashing upon an emerging power. In fact, that is exactly how it's sold. And like, and I, I think there's something to that. So there's this, I always say there's the truth value to an utterance and the practical value to an utterance. And so there's some truth to it, but it's also mostly practical. Like imagine you're a jujitsu instructor and you believe in the art that you're teaching. What is a better example than this giant traditional military power filled with tons of people who are large versus this tiny island with people that are generally smaller. And wait, those guys just, just beat those guys? And especially if you're teaching an art where the, the selling point is you, a smaller, weaker opponent can defeat a larger opponent, like mil a military conflict like that is exactly what you want to sort of use to, to sort of sell it. And remember also too, that at this time, we didn't have the kind of communications technologies that we do now. And so this, and, and Pedrero's book Craze really gets into this, which is, is super fun in that 
this creates an opportunity for people that may or may not actually know jujitsu to be teaching jujitsu in uh, you know places like America and Brazil, because all you know is this mystical art that you've never seen caused this tiny nation to defeat this larger nation. You want to learn that. And, and so that's part of what I think drew, drove, and at least that, that's Pedrera's claim, is that that's part of what drew, drew, you know, drove jiu-jitsu around the turn of the last century. Did I answer the question you actually asked? Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. That begs the question that as, um, as jiu-jitsu moved into South America with the, the Japanese diaspora, um, at, at the same time, um, didn't the, uh, what was it not uh, judo people that went into Russia and started with the sambo tradition? So, yeah, no, absolutely, and like, and, and so this is the thing. Like for for Kano, this was all part of his plan. Like he wanted folks to go and spread judo everywhere. And like I mentioned too, like, and so so a, a thing I want to mention, like, so Kano really wanted this to happen. He wanted judo to go everywhere, and part of why. And I mentioned this in the, in the first presentation, like one common theory and something that I subscribe to about why we call what we do jujitsu, Drysdale thinks we should call, ju we should call it Brazilian judo because essentially Maeda and Sadamiyako were teaching judo. They were Kodakan guys. And, the, and so there's some folks that say, well, and, and I mean, there's some merit to this argument too, that those guys traveled from place to place and picked up techniques from sambists, from catch wrestlers. And so, and, but, but I think what, what it also was is that Kano did not condone professional fighting for under, the, under, the, under the umbrella of judo. And so you would, if you were a guy like Maeda who had to make a living fighting professionally or Masahiko Kimura, you would call what you did jujitsu because you knew that, oh man, Kano, Kano doesn't, doesn't want me to do this. And, uh, and so, yeah, so, so, and, and that, that, that sort of, did, did I get it, what you were asking about? Absolutely, yep. Um, I was just, I, and maybe we're not at that point in the narrative yet where we have the judokas moving to Brazil to teach like Maeda, but um, I, I, and I can't remember the name of the person that went into Russia and originally started teaching there. Yeah, we, I, the, in a future presentation, we will talk about Russia, but I'm not as educated about that as I need to be right now. And yeah, the first judoka that we know of, and the, it, it's funny too, like a, a thought experiment that we talked about in the last class was, Maeda actually opens a school in America in 1906 before he ever goes to Brazil and he just can't get any more than 10 students at any given time. So I think of it as like, what a fascinating thought experiment of like, what if all these New Yorkers were like, man, I want to learn this from this guy. And he never, you know, what if he never went to Brazil? Um, but yeah, Sada Miyako is the first, that we, the first judoka that we know of in, in Brazil in 1908. Other questions, y'all? Going once, going twice. Hey, Jeff, real quick. Yeah. So you might get a little bit more into this in the next um, the next Zoom meeting that you do, but have you read this book, The Game of Jiu-Jitsu? I have not, but I already want to. So from what I understand, it was written in 1906. And a lot of what it talks about is very uh, sort of suggestive and, and representative of, I guess, what some would call like the, um, you know, the dialogue that Elio Gracie espoused, the, the smaller person beating the larger person, that whole dynamic uh, being like a huge selling or marketing point, if you want to call it that. But uh, this book is, is super, super interesting. I just recently found out about it. I don't even remember where. Um, but I really recommend it. It's called The Game of Jiu-Jitsu. So if you guys can track it down, it's a little tough to, I found it on um, Amazon actually, but I don't know how many copies were left. Um, and I had to check a few different sources to find it, but awesome, super interesting stuff. So if I, if I, so I just Googled it and it looks like that's Tani that wrote that. Yes. And so he's pretty, so we, we will talk about him in the, in the next, uh, in the next episode. Cause he's one of the, he's one of the qualified instructors. So there's a guy named Edward Barton, right. Who, uh, is in, is a, uh, a British guy uh -huh. who goes to Japan and comes back and starts teaching an art that he calls Bartitsu or Baritsu. And that's yeah. the art that is in the Sherlock Holmes books. And right. he's, he's kind of a huckster. Like it's unclear if he trained or if he did how much he trained. But at that time you were like, I have been to Japan 
Yeah. But he does bring in qualified instructors like Tani, like Sadakazu Uyanishi, and the, and start some stuff. So I thank you for showing me that book. I haven't seen it and I can't wait to read it. Yeah, I think you'll like it a lot. I was really surprised that I hadn't heard of it before because when you pick it up, you'll kind of see like it's very, it echoes everything that, you know, a lot of what Ella Grace had talked about for sure. Most definitely. Exciting stuff. Thanks, Drew. Yeah. Dudes, anything else for the good of the order? Let me just say once again, thank you guys so much. I'm having a blast doing these. Hopefully y'all are enjoying them as well. If you missed out or came in late, uh, I'm going to put it up on, it, it's streaming on YouTube right now, but I'm going to edit it and put the edited version on YouTube tonight or tomorrow. So um, if you missed, if you missed part of it, you won't have to worry about it. Um, next week, I want to say this, we are going over Count Coma and the Diaspora. We'll talk about how the art spreads to Europe and North America. We'll talk about South America. We'll talk about the suffragettes in Europe that are taught by Barton Wright, as well as uh, Tani and Uyanishi. And of course, we'll talk about President Roosevelt because that's really fun. So that's what we'll do. As always, um, if there was any questions you guys forgot to ask, just hit me up at jeff at uh, Stay safe, stay healthy. We'll be back to training before we know it. And uh, I'm really happy to be on the journey with you guys. So thanks for showing up.